Okay, technology working. We could not have had a more perfect person sharing experiences, both with the idea that it can go a long time before people understand what they're going through and the way that brings chaos, unnecessary chaos, but also the importance of our just being supportive of young people. And I think the point that right now things are particularly hard for young people is what I want to focus on this morning. So the kids are not all right. I think we know that. As it was mentioned earlier, I have no disclosure. So this morning, I'm going to review the prevalence of mental health disorders in children and adolescents, both before and after the pandemic, discuss the psychological consequences of the COVID pandemic on youth mental health, share a few results from the Adolescent Depression Awareness Program, and then discuss strategies for educating middle school students about anxiety and depression. So if we look at information from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Program, every two years they do a major assessment of high school students. So for example, in 2019, they surveyed over 13,000. So it's large surveys. So this slide shows data going from 2009 to 2019. And what the CDC, who sponsors the survey, will do is put a big red stop sign for anything where the trend is concerning, and the yellow caution is that it's concerning because it has not improved. So every year they ask these five questions about mental health. The survey does more than that. They talk about other health behaviors, substance, trauma, things like that. But these are the mental health questions. So the percent of high school students that say yes, they've experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, has gone from 26% which is concerning in 2009, to th almost 37% in 2019. Just to highlight a couple more, made a suicide plan from roughly 11%, a decade later, almost 16%. And then probably most concerningly, made an attempt from 6% in 2009 to almost 9% in 2019. So we knew these trends were happening, and there was a lot of speculation. I think, beautifully, we just heard it. You know, there are more stressors, there are concerns about violence in the community. We don't quite know what social media is doing, but I think we all know it's not good. And so all of these different things were leading to these concerning trends before COVID. Just one other study to share with you. This was a national survey of parents asking about their children's mental health. So again, done in 2016, so before the pandemic. And what they did is they found that overall, there was roughly 16% of children that had at least one mental health condition. And then for this graph, they took the rates and they put them into quartiles. So the states with the lowest percent of children with a mental health condition are the lightest blue, and those with the highest rates in the, in the top quartile are in a darker blue. And what you can see is that over here, I have no pointer, but to the side, you can see it's all over the place. In the different states, there's not a clear pattern. The second map shows those who are not receiving treatment. The national average was 49%. And this is from parents, so we know it's accurate. So 49% of parents said their children were not receiving care from a mental health professional. And here again, you can see, and I'm proud to say that Maryland is one of the lightest states, so it's in the lowest, meaning more children here are receiving care. And then you can see a clear pattern where the darker blues are along the southeast and in some of the uh, western states. And so pre-COVID, we already had this mental health crisis. Many children are having issues and they're not getting treatment. And then this happens. This is a picture from the New York Times from a book review called The Stolen Year, where the author is talking about the impact of the pandemic. And so what do we know? We know that there was this immediate shutdown for public health reasons, and so young people were not in school, were not spending time with friends, and had this dramatic shift. And we all know what that was like, and it was you know, really concerning for everyone and for all of us pre-vaccines and everything else, really concerning about what was going to happen. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a survey that said, let's take the old literature 
and see what we know about social isolation and loneliness among young people. So they found 63 studies that had looked at the impact of social isolation and loneliness on the mental health of young people who were previously healthy. And so the thought was, we'll see what we can anticipate. There was a very strong association between loneliness and an increased risk of depression. And there was an association, but not quite as strong, with loneliness and anxiety disorders. And in those studies that had prospective capacity to see what developed, some studies showed that there was an association for future depression and anxiety symptoms with social isolation and loneliness. So that's already concerning. Another whole group of studies that came out, again, early in the pandemic, looked for what particular risk factors there might be for depression and anxiety for young people. Very consistently, they found that being older, so a high school versus middle school or grade school student, female gender, financial strain in the family, higher levels of parental distress, and living in an area with high rates of COVID infection. Again, these are all from early in the pandemic. I'm gonna share what we've learned over the next year or so. One particular study looked at the rates of depression and then anxiety symptoms comparing primary, this is an international study, so primary means elementary school, junior secondary means middle school, and senior secondary means high school. So it's very clear that there's this pattern that there are certainly anxiety and depressive symptoms present for younger kids, but much higher rates among those in high school. And when you think about that, why might it be? Well, think about it. What are the positive aspects of being at home? So suddenly, you're not having your life, you're now home. You're in Zoom school, you're doing all those things. Well, some positives, and these are from a survey of kids saying what was positive. Some said more time with parents. Some said more time that they could be at home. Remember, there are electronics in many of these homes. So more time spent on personal activities. So this sort of sense of, well, you know, I don't have to do all that so I can do more of what I want. And we all remember at the beginning of the pandemic, almost everything was pass fail. They were really trying to just get kids through. The negatives were not being able to meet with friends and classmates and not being able to hang out. Again, that's language from the students. Not surprisingly, the little kids didn't mind being at home because at that developmental stage, more time with your parents is welcome. It is a rare high school student where more time with your parents would be welcome, right? They want to be hanging. It is the developmental shift that you're focused on peers at that point, not your you know, parents. And so that makes sense. Now, what happened last year is that the Surgeon General issued a call to action focusing on protecting youth mental health. The Surgeon General will do this when they see a clear crisis. And this is a wonderful for report for any of you that are interested in this subject because they did a really comprehensive evaluation of the literature and are able to really identify some of the risk factors as well as the really at highest risk groups. I'm going to share some of those results now. So the risk factors contributing to youth mental health symptoms during the pandemic include, not surprisingly, having had a previous mental health condition, so we all know that, that if you are dealing with depression or anxiety and are put in a high stress situation, you're more likely to have symptoms. Living in an urban area or an, er an area where they had very high rates of COVID outbreaks. Having parents or caregivers who were frontline workers. And I know from many of you who helped take care of our colleagues, this was a big issue. People were worried about taking illness home, and the families were worried about, you worked in the hospital, but are you okay when you come home? Having parents or caregivers at elevated risk of burnout. So an example would be someone who's trying to work full-time from home, but also be a full-time Zoom school teacher. Now sort of imagine that scenario. And then being worried about COVID. Different kids had different levels of worry about just the infection. Other risk factors included experiencing disruptions in routine, which was nearly universal, having more adverse childhood experiences, which we know put someone at higher risk for developing depression and anxiety later, it's, uh, experiencing more financial instability, 
food shortages or housing instability, and then finally experiencing trauma, such as losing a family member or caregiver. This is a startling fact. Between April 2020 and June 30th, 2021, over 140,000 kids lost a parent or a grandparent caregiver. So there is this new group of people that have had, that either became orphaned or had a, had a loss of a primary caregiver. They also were able to identify groups of young people who are at higher risk for mental health challenges. Not surprisingly, that includes those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, those in racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus youth, low income youth, those living in rural areas, those in immigrant households, and those in special populations, particularly juvenile justice, involved with child welfare, or those who are homeless. I mean, we know that the vast majority of young people in juvenile justice actually have a mental health condition. And so we have these groups that are at very, very high risk. And so then the thought is, well, how big a problem is this? So, Dr. Aysen and colleagues did a very thoughtful meta-analysis looking at depressive and anxiety symptoms during the pandemic. They did a comprehensive review of the literature and did the systematic way of selecting 29 studies that would involve more than 80,000 youth to include in this meta-analysis. They were estimating the prevalence of clinically elevated depression and anxiety symptoms. And what does that mean? That means most of these are based on screening tests. It means that you met the threshold on the screening test. Again, that's not a diagnosis. We know this is not a FIPS history, but it gives you a sense if there's a problem. So you either cross the threshold or if there are categories, you were in the moderate to severe range. So this is not having mild symptoms, which sometimes when we see these screens, we worry that mild symptoms are being what's reported. They did not do that. So what were the estimated rates? With depression, it was 25%. For anxiety, 20%. That is doubling the pre-pandemic rates. Now again, that doesn't mean that all of these young people have an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder, like major depression, but it is very concerning to have a doubling of the rates. They found that the rates were higher, collected later in the pandemic, that is more than a little concerning, and higher in young women, and the depressive symptoms were higher in older children, which makes sense when you think about the age of onset, that that's part of that. So what are some of the psychological consequences of the COVID pandemic on youth mental health? This was a survey that the Department of Education does monthly. And so this is a survey where they looked at 830 schools and got impact from teachers and administrators. And this was done in April 2022. So very, very recent data. 70% of schools reported an increase in the number of students seeking mental health services since the beginning of the pandemic. 76% of schools reported an increase in staff expressing concerns about students having symptoms of depression, anxiety, and trauma. Only 12% of public schools strongly agreed they could effectively provide mental health services to all students in need. We know that the embedding of services can be very, very effective, but it's limited. It's limited in how many schools even have any of those types of services. And the limitations that they identified, again, this is coming from the educators, where there were insufficient number of mental health professionals, those are in school, that they had inadequate access to licensed mental health professionals and inadequate funding. Many of you know that I have been before the pandemic, traveling around the country doing ADAP trainings. I have never done a training where I did not hear that we do not have enough child psychiatrists and other mental health professionals focusing on treating children. They said, it's helpful for someone to know what's going on, but we really need to be focusing on that as well. And sadly, what I could say is I agree. That's a crisis too. And so this is all going on. And it led to the three largest pediatric-focused organizations. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, 
and the Children's Hospital Association coming together to declare a national emergency in children's mental health. Part of the Surgeon General's report call to action said, what could different people do? Because I have limited time, I'm going to just focus on what they recommended that the schools do. But they had great recommendations for parents and for young people and for professionals. But today, because of my topic, I want to focus on what Surgeon General was saying. This is what we think educators and school districts should do. One, not surprisingly, is try to have more positive and safe and affirming school environments, especially for some of our minority youth and sexual minority youth that could go a long way to improve, obviously, their experience in school, but also add support. Learn to recognize signs of changes in mental and physical health among students. I can tell you in ADAP, every time someone said, look, I'm the principal, and I'm not going to teach, but can I come to the training, I was thrilled because having more people that are actually aware of what young people might be going through is critical. Providing a continuum of supports, and that, I believe, optimally would involve embedding more mental health care in the schools, where young people just have to walk down the hall. They don't have to get a parent that takes time off from work to get them to an appointment. Expanding school-based mental health workforce so we can actually do that. Support the mental health of all school personnel. I think that the pandemic we know was hard on those of us as frontline healthcare workers. I think they were frontline workers in a different way, especially when they were trying to go back and say, what does this mean and is it safe, all of those things. And trying to be advocates to make sure that young people are enrolled in healthcare. You know, we still thankfully have programs where most young people can qualify and then they can get services without it being such a burden for the families. We need to protect those with higher needs. I showed you a whole group of people that are at risk, and with those young people being more vigilant about whether they're having symptoms and checking in with them. And then lastly, and obviously importantly to me, expand social emotional learning programs and other evidence-based approaches. Now, Dr. Triplett very kindly talked about ADAP um, there might be someone left in the department that doesn't know about ADAP, so I'm going to just spend a minute or two to talk about it. So the Adolescent Depression Awareness Program is a school-based education program designed to teach high school students about depression. It's three hours roughly in length, three classes, and it's had a path over the last 20 years, but now the model is that high school school-based educators, so counselors or teachers are trained and then they do the teaching. We developed the ADKQ, the Adolescent Depression Knowledge Questionnaire, to be able to do an assessment about whether the students were actually changing their knowledge. That includes some questions about attitudes. We have not, with the exception of one subset in this randomized controlled trial, asked the students about their own symptoms because my focus has always been on dissemination rather than getting individual parental consent because that would limit, I think, how many students we could reach. So these data are from the randomized controlled trial, which was led by Dr. Holly Wilcox in the School of Public Health. And it demonstrates that there is an improvement in the percent who are depression literate. So that is the knowledge. And you can see. Here are the gold bars of the controls, who in the first year did not have the ADAP curriculum, but had it the second year in this study, and those who had the intervention or the ADAP curriculum taught to them. And you can see it's about 3,000 students that were in the control group and almost 3,700 that were in the ADAP group. And I'm showing you this because it's my favorite slide ever. There is an improvement in knowledge that was present at the post-test, which was six weeks unannounced, that's always how we've done it because we've wanted to capture really knowledge that people can use, not whether you could cram for a test. And then the follow-up was at four months. So they had a change in knowledge that was sustained. This study was done in, in 64 different schools in five different states. So we had a, a really nice mix of uh, different students from very different backgrounds. As a part of that, the randomized controlled trial, there was a separate study 
where teachers who were trained in doing the teaching were given the option to voluntarily enter a follow-up study of the actual teachers, and 65 agreed to do that. They completed the same knowledge questionnaire, the ADKQ, before the training and then at follow-up later. Not surprisingly, the teachers that had better depression literacy, who got more out of the training or perhaps came with better knowledge, were more effective in teaching. The whole point of the ADAPT curriculum is really in many different ways to teach young people that depression is a treatable medical illness. And having trained over 3,000 health teachers who mainly teach gym, they do not come to the training necessarily believing that, right? And so it, the training in many ways is a conversion experience, I hope, where people leave with that because if you don't believe it, you can't teach it. And in this analysis that Dr. Leslie Miller led, they also asked the teachers, did anyone ask you about getting help for themselves or a friend? And after one three-class intervention, 46% of teachers said a student came to talk to me. So I think that can make us enthusiastic that changing knowledge and awareness can lead to help seeking. So this is just to give you a sense of how we have done this. And I want to tell you that we've reached over 131,000 kids because I want to tell you that. But the, the point of this is if you look at the very beginning for about six years, a tiny group of us, three psychiatrists and two psychiatric nurses did all the teaching as we were trying to determine, is this even doable? And then I gave grand rounds here once and a good friend of mine said, well, yes, you can do this, but can anyone else do it? We said, well, we have a plan for that, and that is to next train nursing and medical students, and with those nursing and medical students, see if someone who's not a mood disorder specialist can teach. And when that was successful, we then said, now we're going to start training the teachers. And between 2010 and 2013, many, many, many in-person trainings were done around the country. But then we started thinking we're going to need to take this to a different model because that is not sustainable and will limit our expansion. So we did a first website, which was not very sophisticated, but sort of worked, and then started thinking that we really needed to shift to web-based training. So in 2019, we started working on a training website, which means that in, when COVID hit, this was already nearly done. So starting in the summer of 2020, we could do all of the training online. So teachers can go, click on that yellow box that says start teaching today, sign up, go through the entire training program that we used to do in person, get all the teaching materials they need, and then implement in their school at no cost to the school. Because we've had tremendous support to build the website and put this all together. And so that's how we've been able to maintain this effort during the pandemic, which I'm really pleased about. Now I want to take a couple minutes just to tell you about two new initiatives. The first is really fun. ADEP Italia. Dr. Sarah Kolica, during her track time, translated the entire curriculum, all the films, they're all now captioned. And we're also lucky because her wonderful mother is a teacher in Italy and has gotten us connected. So this year she's going to be able to teach ADEP in Italy, so we're going international. And then we started thinking about where do we go next? Is it colleges or middle school? I can tell you from an early project, every college is its own world, so that's nearly impossible. And every training we would invite anyone that wanted to come, that could include middle school counselors, but say the programs for high school kids, you can't teach middle school kids. And they would just hammer on me. My students are very sophisticated. They're really quite old for their age. I said, like, no, it's developmentally appropriate for high school. So, we started thinking if we're going to go to younger kids, we were thinking about the fact that anxiety often predates depression. Throughout the literature, there are studies that show that on average, the onset of anxiety is younger. In some longitudinal studies, anxiety often predates depression. This is from a New Zealand cohort where they had 275 cases of juvenile onset anxiety. And you can see that in 41% of those cases, the anxiety came before depression. 28% it didn't come at all, but the majority had it either co-occurring or the anxiety was before. So when we started thinking about what are we gonna do for middle school, 
we said we really need to have a focus of anxiety. So ADAP Junior High, which is going to be targeting middle school students, is the Anxiety and Depression Awareness Program. And I am thrilled that Dr. Claire Zachek is taking the lead. As you know, she's a tremendous child psychiatrist, and that's what we need for this program. So she's leading a group of great people, including Mariel Cataldi and Ali Bailey and Sarah Colica and Candace Espinoza. And what we are doing is a scoping review where we're looking uh, to see. We also have an informationalist, Mr. White, from the, who helped us design all of this from the Welsh Library. So what are we doing in this scoping review? We're looking to see what's already been done. So this is a systematic literature review where we're looking for universal school-based psychoeducation programs for middle school students and where they've implemented and have outcomes. You know, we don't want an idea or someone saying we think this would be great. We have completed, this is an achievement, uh, the title and abstract screenings for over 4,600 papers, and we're about to start doing the full text reviews for the 308 papers that have been identified as needing more information. So far, from our initial screens, the majority of programs focus on either social emotional learning or wellness, and there are very few that seem to have anything to do with anxiety or depression. Now we have another tremendous group of people that have been working on brainstorming about what we should do next. And this is really fun. I actually will show you from our first brainstorming session, we have a lot of details. I'm not going to ask you to read that, although my writing is fairly tidy. But I do want to point out my favorite part of it. And what that says is build a face Mr. Potato Head with the idea of that's a way that kids can talk about emotions. So what did we come up with and what are we planning to do? We're going to have a focus on anxiety, depression, and skills building. Currently, the plan is to do nine different 15-minute modules. We're going to have animated videos rather than young people talking about their own experience because they're so young it's not really appropriate to ask them. Each module will have some teaching, a video, and some sort of active activity. We'll have a model, again, of counselors or health teachers doing the education. And the idea is that the modules can be grouped. So it might be that you do three classes where you do three, or you could do one a day. So there'll be flexibility for the schools. So the current modules we're planning are things like what is stress, emotions, where we'll talk about depression and anxiety, fear and anxiety, helpful versus unhelpful anxiety, when is anxiety a medical problem, be brave, do the thing that scares you, which is about exposures, Coping skills tool belt, so a bunch of different things, including breathing and mindfulness that'd be appropriate for middle school. Discussion of values and goals that comes out of ACT. And then what to do, tell an adult. That is the last thing that we say in every ADAP class. If you're concerned about yourself or a friend, tell an adult. An adult can help get the next right thing to happen. So what are we doing? We are in the middle of a mental health crisis for adolescents and young adults that has clearly worsened during the pandemic. We know that school-based education programs have the potential to increase knowledge and awareness and encourage students to seek treatment from our experience with ADAP. Our web-based training program has facilitated a much broader distribution at no cost to schools, and that's a model we're going to build on. We know that there are very few programs for middle school students, not just from the scoping review, but also my many, many conversations with middle school counselors who are really hoping to have something that they can bring. And my thought is that since we are building on what we've already done and our relationships with schools, ADAP Junior High is going to be able to achieve broad di dissemination in a fraction of the time. We can eliminate the whole part where we say, I wonder if we can teach other people to do this. And I wonder how we do training. So I believe that Dr. Zachek's going to be able to do in six or seven years what it took us 20. And with that, I am very happy to take questions. All right.
right, that was wonderful. Thank you, Karen. It's so exciting, too, to hear that you're going to be branching out into the middle schools. Or that it's obviously there's going to be so much potential to have a, a positive impact there. So I'm very happy to hear that. Um, I also have like a, I feel like a million questions. I'll keep it to one. Um, so I'm just curious, with the, this transition back to something like normal, we're seeing, I'm not going to name names, but uh, an embrace, uh, embracing of normal. People mm -hmm. going back to you know the way things should be, um, teenagers in particular. Um, I'm just curious, what, how long of a tail do you think this is going to have, this cohort uh, of kids with increased uh, what depression we know anxiety? From, here's what we know for all of us. If you look at what we know and what George Everly certainly has taught many of us about disaster psychiatry, the psychological consequences come after, and they last for years. I think this tale we're looking at for adults and young people is going to be years. And I don't think we're ready. And I think that we're going to have to do some major efforts of educating our colleagues in primary care, in pediatrics, and in internal medicine if we're going to have any hope of matching what's going to be needed. Lots of work to do. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Dr. Bienvenue. Yeah, it's because there's not a reason to think it really would be given the age of onset. I think that I think that it's hard for people to capture what anxiety is. You know, the concept that we talk about to the high school students about depression is little D versus big D, which you so kindly alluded to when you were talking about your experiences. I think the difference between little A, normal anxiety and nervousness and being a worried person and the kind of anxiety that's problematic is really hard to capture. And I think young people have a lot of trouble with that. And so I think that it is a methodology issue rather than a truthful issue. And you are one of our true anxiety experts. Would you agree? I, I, I'm guessing the question is the age is Yeah. Yes. They're asking these screening questions where it just doesn't quite capture it. And I think that when you do screens for depression and you hear about sleep, appetite, energy, concentration, it, those are easier to individually answer in a way that makes someone realize there's something going on. Dr. Redgrave. Just to follow on to, to Dr. Tipper, first of all, this is, can I just say how glad you're to be in this room and to be done and all of it? All of it, I agree. Yeah, um, and that was a lovely, lovely talk. Do you, are you, given Pat, your response to the Pat's question of the long tail, under what circumstances Well, I think with COVID, we would target COVID-related modules first for high school. But my, you know me, I'm always plotting the next thing. I have a bunch of ideas. You know, Dr. Kate McFarland's going to come back, we hope, in July 2023. And I want to focus on something for LGBTQ plus youth. I want to, we could have something related to COVID. I wanted to do something that targets different communities. Often people will say, well, you know, there's a big issue with stigma in my community. And I say, oh, all communities, but it's slightly different, right? We know there's terrible stigma among the medical community about, COVID, about depression, but it takes a slightly different form than perhaps in, you know, the African-American community near the school or in other communities. And so I think we have to have opportunities for more discussion. Now, the, the way ADAP's written, there is that opportunity because it's not scripted. It's really meant to be discussion-based, but I think we could do even more to help people recognize, perhaps for them, it's showing up a different way. Dr. Cynthia Major <laughs> and I went to City Hospital in 2001. Thank you.
I, I would love it. I, different school districts, I've learned a lot about school districts. They are challenges, I'll simply say that. If anyone knows connections, I mean, now we can go because we can say we have a training that teachers can take at their own pace. They don't have to have a professional day. It's free, and all the teaching materials are free. Someone asked me one time, well, why, would, why should someone do your program versus another? I, of course, wanted to say, well, because it's my program, but I didn't. <laughs> because I didn't think that would be very convincing to someone I didn't know. I said, well, ADAP is free. He said, really? I said, yes. And that is from an incredible tradition of philanthropy that has allowed us to do that, including building the website. So it's all free. They could sign up and we have unlimited capacity. They could sign up tomorrow and I'll do it. Yes. Well, and that's the next step for ADAP, right? We have built it, and then the pandemic hit, and we've all been a little distracted and busy. But now, as we're coming out of it, two things. We're going to work on ADAP Junior High. We have a great team doing that. My passion now is to get broader dissemination of ADAP. That's what I think it's time to do. And that's probably going to, I once spoke at the American School Health Association, you know, all the health teachers, and that was great, but we didn't have this. And like, what can you do? It's like, wish me luck. And hopefully, you know, now we can actually say, sign up right now. Go to the website and sign up right now and you can do it. Well, I think in medical education, it's what I said earlier, it's not realistic to think it, everyone can be taken care of by a mental health provider, but in a public health model, we probably don't need that. We need the straightforward cases to be well managed by pediatricians, primary care doctors, and here there are tremendous efforts with BHIP and others to provide consultation for primary care for pediatricians specifically, so I think that has to improve. Now, I think that in general, that we just want everyone to know more about depression. When I lecture during the basic clerkship, I always say, I'm biased, but this is the subject that no matter what you go into, you need to know. Maybe because of the patients you're caring for because it's so common, but also it is what's gonna affect our own friends and neighbors and family members, so. Great, I think we have time to squeeze in one last question. Dr. Dr. Paula. Well, and that's when people have said, is there any benefit of just knowledge? And I think there is. I think there's benefit to know that I'm not a screw up. I'm not, there's not something inherently wrong with me as a person. Something has happened to me and it's not my fault and there's potential to treat it. I just think that that makes an enormous difference. And I think we see that every day on the wards. That we can actually explain to people what they're experiencing. That in and of itself instills hope and that 
is critical for actually getting someone engaged in treatment. That's great. All right. Well, we're at time. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Thank you to your patient as well, doing a wonderful job. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's a great way to get back into in person.